at uh, 10.15, so I'm going to go ahead and start talking. If people are still coming in, that's okay. Um, so, I am Andrew Waller. This is, is David, now among the prophets, reading the Psalms as prophecy with the apostles. Uh, our first session is entitled, Water Skiing, the Psalms, and You. The reasons for that title will become obvious as we go. Um, I always have trouble trying to figure out how to start these things because we're kind of trying to introduce exactly what we're going to be doing, uh, and sometimes that can prove challenging. But I have three basic things I want to go over today. Number one, our goals for this class. What is it that we are trying to do? What questions are we trying to answer? Uh, number two, we're going to look at two different uh, snippets from Acts that will sort of give you a sense of uh, the sort of thing that we're going to be looking at in terms of how the New Testament authors are using the Psalms. And then thirdly, we're just going to ask some initial questions. So I'll kind of lay out what, what is the problem that we're trying to solve in this class. So here we go. Um, so there are a few different things that we're going to be looking at, and really the title says it all. So one of the main things that we're going to be doing is actually reading the Psalms. So we want to know, how are we approaching the Psalms as readers? Uh, how do we read them? What are the normal things that we think about when we're reading Psalms? What are the assumptions and habits that we have that we then bring to the text when we go to try to understand what the Psalms are all about? We need to know what those things are. Number two, we're trying to read the Psalms as prophecy. And what I mean by that will become clear, but... If we're going to read the Psalms as prophecy, we also need to know what habits and assumptions we bring to prophetic material in the Bible. So when we read the prophets, what are some of the habits and assumptions that we bring to those sorts of texts? And then how do the Psalms fit into that? So if we're going to read the Psalms as prophecy, we have to be aware of how we react to those sorts of texts. Um, and then also, how do the Psalms, if we are going to read them prophetically or in a prophetic way, how does that then fit into sort of the big story of God's people, the prophetic mission that God has for his church? And then thirdly, we're reading the Psalms as prophecy with the apostles. So how do the apostles approach reading the Psalms in this way? And for that matter, how do the other New Testament authors approach reading the Psalms? Uh, because, as you'll find out, the way that they read the Psalms is really different from the way that we sort of naturally read the Psalms. Um, and then, secondly, how do those apostolic reading strategies challenge our own ways of reading? So, if the apostles are reading the Psalms in a way that's different than we are, perfect. How do those strategies, those ways of reading, challenge our own assumptions as readers? We need to be aware of that. Uh, and then how does reading the Psalms as prophecy in an apostle-like way, how does that help us to understand the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus? Um, we're going to unpack all of this. I'm just kind of like putting out all of the things on the table so you can kind of get a sense for what's going on. Uh, are there any just initial questions at this point? Are you yourself? Yes, I am. Okay. As we speak. So really what this means is that we're kind of covering three different areas of the Christian life. We're going to talk about how we read stuff. We're going to talk about what we learn from that reading. And then we're going to talk about how that reading affects our, our life as Christians in the world. So how we read, what we learn, and then how we live, worship, and serve. So those are kind of the three things that, that we are wanting to grow in. Uh, in other words, discipleship, right? This is the school of discipleship, not the school of hermeneutical implications or whatever, right? Our goal is discipleship. Uh, sometimes we assume that information automatically equals wisdom. Uh, or we assume that just because we are learning stuff about God or about the Bible, that this is automatically helpful. Uh, this is not the case. Really, what we're after in terms of 
discipleship because this is the school of discipleship, not the school of cool Bible information. Uh, we're really after wisdom. How do we live wisely? How do we read wisely as Christians? Uh, and so I'm going to try to bake some of that into this class. So I'm not just giving you stuff to know, but hopefully uh, pointing you in a direction that leads to wisdom. Okay. Uh, just to start out with, uh, I mentioned we want to be aware of our assumptions about the Psalms and about the prophets and prophecy. What are some words that come to mind when you think of the Psalms? When you think of, okay, the Psalter, the Psalms, how we read them, what are some things that you think about? Do you want us to just like say them out? Yep, just shout out some stuff. Verse. What's that? Verse. Verse, yes. Poetry. Yeah, they're poetic. Um, poetry, yeah. What else? Song. Song. Worship. Yes, worship. Revenge. Ooh, revenge. <laughs> uh, actually, yes, we're going to talk about that today. Revenge. Uh, we might even say emotion, right? The Psalms are very emotional. Laments. Laments, yes. No pictures. There are word pictures. <laughs> there are word pictures. Threats. Uh, what was that? Threats. Threats, yes. Absolutely. Um, okay. Yes. What about prophecy? Um, when we think about this list and then we go to think about prophecy, uh, what are some things that come to mind? Truth. Truth. Interesting. Retrospect. Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, well, it never really makes any sense, I feel like, before it's actually come to pass. Okay, so we might even add the word fulfillment, right? Lots of prophetic material doesn't make sense until the prophecy or the story is complete. Yeah. Messianic? Okay, messianic. Still with the poetry. Yes, yeah, still, still poetry. So, okay, yeah, this is a good, a good list. I'm just going to leave this up here, and we can think about this as we actually look at some real stuff. But just at the outset, there are some actual similarities, and I'm glad those have kind of come to light. Uh, the prophetic material in Scripture is, by and large, poetry. Uh, it's not prose for the most part. There are some prose sections uh, involved in prophetic material. Uh, the book of Daniel is a great example of that. Lots of prose there. Um, but they're kind of for different purposes, right? The Psalms uh, sort of inherently oriented towards worship, singing, things like that. Uh, even if you think about at Redeemer, the way that we incorporate the Psalter into our worship service is usually through song of some kind, whether that is uh, a hymn, a, a metrical chance version of a psalm. Typically, you won't see a psalm either as the sermon text or as one of the readings uh, from the lectionary. We typically sing the psalms, and that's a good thing, um, but that might also kind of limit our understanding of the psalms a little bit. Uh, we aren't used to thinking of the Psalms as sort of God's word in the same way that other parts of God's word are God's word, if that makes sense. We're used to thinking the, of them in terms of worship or devotion or song, which is just a little different. And as we'll see, the apostles may or may not be thinking in the same way. Okay. Any questions so far? Let's look at some real stuff. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense for why I am talking about this particular subject, uh, most of the academic work that I do is in Luke-Acts. So um, I focus on the story of Luke-Acts, uh, looking at narrative theology and these sorts of things. And there's this really interesting thing that happens in Acts 1. So in Acts 1, you have Jesus ascending to the Father. He's leaving his disciples, the apostles, to kind of fend for themselves and to carry on his mission without him. Um, and you have Peter kind of emerging as this leader of the apostles. And this 
section right here is kind of the first time that Peter really stands up and starts saying stuff. So he's kind of stepping into this role as the leader of the apostles in the absence of Jesus. And he says some really interesting things. So in those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. I cropped out a little bit for the sake of space. Uh, but he says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. And they prayed and said, you Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Okay, so just a few things at the outset. Uh, look how he is talking about these two psalms. Uh, these are quotations from Psalm 69 and Psalm 109. Look how he's speaking about them. Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before him by the mouth of David. Now, the Holy Spirit speaking through people in the Old Testament is exclusively applied to people who are prophets or people who have been given <clears throat> the prophetic gift by God. And so the fact that he is saying that the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David means that in Peter's mind, David is a prophet. That's kind of interesting. And he also speaks in the language of the scripture had to be fulfilled. Now, typically when you see, especially in the Gospels uh, and in Acts even, uh, things about the scripture being fulfilled, like later on in Acts 2, uh, Peter himself will talk about how the prophecy in Joel, that the Holy Spirit will fall upon God's people. Uh, he speaks in these terms, the scripture being fulfilled. But Joel is a prophet. Here he's quoting two psalms. So this is interesting. He is treating these two psalms as prophecies to be fulfilled. Does that make sense? Um, and by the way, I'm not going to completely like explain all of this. I'm just sort of, we're going to look more at this later on, but I'm just kind of showing you some interesting stuff. Now, just for kicks, let's look at these two Psalms briefly. So I've taken a chunk out of Psalm 69. Um, I'll read through this. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. The they here is a person who is, who is opposed to the narrator of this Psalm, an enemy. Uh, let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. Here we have the revenge showing up, right? Uh, may there can't be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out from the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Now, if you look at just this entire psalm, there's nothing about it that screams prophecy. Uh, this is actually kind of, I don't know, stereotypical of these sorts of psalms that uh, sort of ask God to punish an enemy. You know, all through the Psalter, there are dozens of psalms like this where the psalmist is asking God to avenge him or to punish evil. And there's not really much that's unique about this one. Um, obviously, we can see a sort of passing a thematic or situational similarity. You know, one who was formerly numbered among the righteous, betraying the righteous, asking God to take revenge upon that person. That's the situation with Judas. And so we kind of see, okay, Peter, I. I understand you're kind of seeing your own situation reflected in this psalm, but there's nothing inherently prophetic about it that would cause us to look at this psalm versus any of the other sort of revenge or imprecatory psalms that exist in the Psalter. Uh, 
Uh, what about Psalm 109? So this is the other one. Uh, it says, when he is tried, let him come forth as guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. May his days be few. May another take his office. So that's the part that Peter quotes. May his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. May his children wander about and beg, seeking food far from the ruins they inhabit. May the creditor seize all that he has. May strangers plunder the fruits of his toil. Let there be none to extend kindness to him, nor any to pity his fatherless children. May his posterity be cut off. May his name be blotted out in the second generation. So once again, this is a psalm that is asking God to avenge and bring punishment upon someone who is guilty, someone who has wronged the community of faith. This is a little different. The psalmist is basically asking God to take what the guilty man has away from him. So we have kind of two things going on. We have uh, asking God to basically destroy or pour out his anger upon the enemy, and then also take away what that enemy has and give it to someone else. So we kind of see where Peter is going with this, but at the same time, there is nothing in these psalms inherently that screams, this is about Judas. And you see the specificity with which Peter talks about these psalms. He's saying, well, here's what he's not saying. He's not saying, hey guys, remember those two psalms that are in the Psalter? They kind of remind me of this situation. Maybe we should use them as some sort of guide uh, in terms of how we should proceed with this Judas situation. No, he's saying the Holy Spirit spoke before him by the mouth of David concerning Judas. He's saying that these psalms are specifically prophecies about Judas. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't usually comb through the Psalter looking for prophecies about Judas or any other biblical character who isn't Jesus. This is weird. Peter is reading the psalms in an inherently different way than we do. And so, with that great theologian Jar Jar Binks, we might ask, excuse me, Peter, what are you doing? Did you, did you not take your hermeneutics class in seminary? Well, he didn't. Um, you know, what, how are you reading the Psalter this way? How can you so tightly connect these two Psalms with Judas? That seems very strange. Did you, uh, were those two Psalms Mm -hmm. In other words, those are different than what we're generally having a service. Oh, uh, true. I don't. Those are, I don't have any statistics uh, on the number of times imprecatory psalms come up versus others, but well, there's a book out there on the imprecatory psalms, and it's hmm. that's where I got that from. That's yeah, different from the regular psalms. Absolutely. So the message is different. Yes. Yeah, so they aren't just laments. Their actual requests for God to, to act in judgment. Uh, okay, let's look at a different example. So here we're at Acts 2. So this is after Pentecost. So the Holy Spirit has come upon the apostles. Uh, Peter is now preaching his Pentecost sermon. Uh, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So Peter here is looking at this psalm as specifically a prophecy about Jesus' resurrection. He goes on to say, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn, had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, 
that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Once again, Peter is not saying, oh, hey, this psalm kind of reminds me of this situation with Jesus. There's not, he's not simply noting a passing thematic similarity or a, a resemblance in situation. But specifically, Peter is reading this psalm, Psalm 16, as a prophecy about Jesus' resurrection. So Psalm 16, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you can see, um, where is the part he's quoting? Oh, there at the end. You will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. This psalm is once again pretty typical. It's a typical psalm that praises God for his uh, preserving of the life of the psalmist, uh, blesses him for the things that God has given to the psalmist. Uh, there's nothing here that, beyond the theme of resurrection, which is a constant theme in the Psalter, beyond that, there isn't anything here that would scream, this is a prophecy about Jesus specifically. But that's what Peter identifies it as. So once again, just to point out, Peter and the apostles are reading the Psalter through different lenses than the lenses that we usually have. Any just questions at this point? Would, would this be part of the uh, education of the uh, apostles by Jesus? And they're worried, pointing out where he was headed in the psalm? Oh, re you mean reading the Psalter in this way? Was that sort of something that Jesus might have spoken with them about? Um, yeah, they had to get this knowledge from someplace, surely. Well, from the Holy Spirit, but I mean. Sure. Uh, so what I will be sort of unpacking for you is that this attitude towards the Psalter, although it is foreign to us, was actually somewhat normal at the time. Um, so in sort of the Second Temple Judaism era, there is this entire idea about David being a prophet. We're going to look at some examples from, uh, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls in which David is spoken of in a prophetic way. So this idea that David is a prophet, it's not something that we're used to thinking about. But at the time, it would have been sort of one of the perspectives on David as even an author of, of the Psalms. So even though this is sort of weird and perhaps unusual to us, it was not to them. Okay. So once again, you know, just going back to kind of the goals, what we're trying to do here, um, really, I'm wanting to turn our attention to, over the next few weeks, those assumptions and habits that we bring to the text. So if we're going to understand, okay, wh what are the apostles doing? How are they reading? What makes them able to interpret the Psalms in this prophetic way without any immediate connections to Jesus? How are they doing that? Uh, we also need to understand how we are sort of naturally reading the Psalter. So, I like this poem. Uh, I think it's a helpful way of understanding our attitude towards poetry. Uh, this was written by Billy Collins. He was uh, the U.S. Poet Laureate, uh, I think from 2001 to 2003. Uh, I'll read this for you, and then we can reflect on it a little bit. He says this, I asked them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide, or press an ear against its hive. I say drop a mouse into a poem and watch him probe his way out, or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of a poem, waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. And I've emphasized uh, those last five lines because I think that sort of encapsulates a tendency that we have as modern readers of scripture. We want to know what scripture really means. Um, we sometimes have what I 
jokingly refer to as the, the Batman method of reading scripture, um, you know, especially with prophetic texts, we will sort of grab Isaiah or Zechariah and sort of shake him and say, what are you really saying? What, what, where is the hidden code that points to Jesus? Uh, or, you know, I'm sure y'all have probably read some things that folks have written over the years about Daniel 7 or Revelation that you kind of scratch your head and you're like, I don't, I don't know if that's it. You know, we don't want to play Da Vinci Code with Scripture. We want to read Scripture in a way that is natural to the text itself. And I think this is partially why when we see Peter using the Psalter in this way, when we see him sort of interpreting the Psalms in a way that seems maybe not obvious to us, we kind of wonder, like, okay, Peter, what are you doing? Uh, this doesn't seem to have anything to do with the original historical intent of the psalm. Uh, so what's going on there? So as we go through uh, the next few weeks together, um, we're going to be answering a few different questions. Um, so if we're to figure out exactly what Peter is doing, number one, we need to figure out what it means for the apostles to call David a prophet. If David is a prophet, like Peter says he is, is he a prophet in the same way that Isaiah is a prophet or that any of the prophets in the Old Testament were prophets? Does it mean something different? Does the idea that David is a prophet mean something different for the Psalms than it does for any other prophetic book? Uh, we're also going to think about the idea of the Messianic Psalm. So, uh, in the history of Christianity, we have identified a set of psalms that are commonly referred to as messianic psalms that we view as specifically pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. So we're going to look at a few of those and just ask some questions about them. Uh, is that a helpful category? Is that an accurate category to use? How does that work if the psalms are prophecy? How does that coincide with the rest of the psalms being prophetic? Um, and how does that fit into how the apostles are interpreting the book of Psalms? Uh, and then we'll also be asking, how does our union with Christ impact our own use of the Psalms? Uh, I'd argue that the entirety of the Christian life is impacted by our union with Christ. And so it's worth asking, if we are united to Christ, then how does this change the way that we read this book if it is, in fact, prophecy about him? So what this is going to look like in terms of the next few weeks, I don't have this quite mapped out week by week. Uh, we'll kind of see how it goes. But we're going to start by looking at, number one, the Psalms and their interpretation. So just going over some basics. How have Christians interpreted the Psalms in the past? What are the tools, the lenses, uh, the frameworks that have been used to figure out what the Psalms mean? So we'll be looking at things like um, liturgical interpretation. Um, you know, looking at the life of David, does that help us interpret the Psalms? How does that impact how we read? Things of that nature. Uh, we'll also be looking at the nature of prophecy in the Old Testament, uh, how prophets came to be viewed during the Hellenistic period, and then also the New Testament. So if we're trying to figure out what it means for David to be a prophet, we need to know what it means for a prophet to exist first, and then figure out how David fits into that. Um, so then we'll look at David the prophet. Um, so how is David spoken of in First and Second Samuel, for example, versus how people closer to the time of the apostles were viewing David? So we'll look at uh, some information from Josephus, the Dead Sea Scrolls, various other texts that would have been around close to the time of the apostles so that we can get a taste for how are the people living at that time thinking about the person of David and how does that fit in with what the apostles have been saying about David as a prophet? And then we're going to go back and look at different instances of the Psalms being identified as prophecy in the New Testament. So we're going to look, go back and look at Acts 1 and 2, uh, later on Acts 4. We're going to look at examples from the Gospels. We're going to look at stuff from Revelation. Uh, anywhere where the Psalms are used in the New Testament, we're going to look at that and see if all of this prophetic stuff changes how we read those things. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the prophetic use of the Psalms in the church. So how can we as Christians, with all of this in mind, read the Psalms in a way that informs 
not only our knowledge and love of Christ, but our life and mission as Christians out here in the world. Um, and really, I, what I hope you notice is that there's a cycle here. Um, so we're kind of starting with our own assumptions and habits about how we read. We're then informing our own assumptions and habits with the assumptions and habits of the text itself. So if Peter is assuming that David is a prophet, we might want to know what that's about and not only have that information, but then use that to improve and build and grow ourselves in our own reading of the text. This is kind of why I like the metaphor of water skiing from that poem. We don't want to be stuck in the water. Uh, we don't want to be sort of hovering above it, but we want to be kind of gliding over the top of the text interpretively, um, if that makes sense. Uh, and ideally, what all of this does is propels us towards greater love for God and neighbor. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. I just want to open the floor for any questions, any ideas that you're interested in talking about, any other things that we can cover. As I said, I'm kind of putting out all this stuff out on the table. Uh, we're going to go back and cover it, but any questions so far? Things that make you uncomfortable about anything that I've said? I got a question. Go for it. Totally forgot what Hellenistic means. Oh, Greek. OK. <laughs> so you know, at the time of the apostles, uh, the Mediterranean world is Greek speaking. Greek culture is kind of the main cultural force in, in the world at the time. I'm curious about from this introduction that I'm excited to hear more about is how um, the, the process of writing prophecy for the prophets themselves, what are the conditions of understanding how much they knew about what their prophecy meant? And I'm excited right. to learn more about that. Yeah, uh, and just to say, I don't know. That That is so. <laughs> incredibly difficult to peel apart, right? When David is writing, you know, Psalm 16, is he aware that he is writing prophecy about Jesus that the apostles will later use to, you know, tell the story of the resurrection? I have no idea. He could just be using normal Hebrew metaphors for God's protection and salvation. Um, but, Nevertheless, Peter points to that and says, well, it's about Jesus. But it is pretty clear that David and Abraham and others were looking for Jesus, right? I mean, you know, you find, you know, Abraham, you know, Jesus says that, right? That Abraham yes. was looking forward to my day. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question. Uh, yeah. So he Hebrews, if you will, is you know, could, you know, kind of the book in the New Testament that, that is the most written about Jesus, right? This is just, not, not his life or anything, but yeah. this is who Jesus is. Definitely. Does this play out in, in Hebrews too? The Psalms? And, um, yes. And I'm trying to remember. I haven't, oh, wow, I haven't compiled my whole like list of okay. things we got to talk about, but I, I seem to remember, yes, uh, the Psalms do show up. Um, so yes. And that's, that's the interesting thing, because you might expect, you know, when Peter, you know, in the first two chapters of Acts, that's kind of Peter's, I am sort of the leader of the apostles, here's, here's what we're about. You know, post-Pentecost, he's preaching his sermon. You might expect him to pull out the Isaiahs, the Zacharias. Uh, he goes to Joel in that sermon to talk about the Holy Spirit. I mean, kind of necessary, given what just happened. Um, but the fact that he also then goes to the Psalms is fascinating. And the idea that David would prophesy about Jesus, the son of David, you know, kind of the, the phenomenon that we see when uh, David writes, uh, my Lord just said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. That's just a really interesting uh, phenomenon. And it's fascinating that this is where Peter goes uh, almost naturally 
to explain and to talk about what's happening. Other questions? when they are or, or something when Jesus did didn't the people call him son of David mm -hmm. so they really had a knowledge of David and how much of the Dead Sea Scrolls have they all been interpreted as of the late 80s and 90s they hadn't been well so the scrolls have all of the material from Qumran uh, the site of the Dead Sea Scrolls discovery uh, has been translated uh, as, as much as we can I mean some of the the documents are fragmentary um, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, because there yeah. was a debate or late in the late 80s, early mm -hmm. 90s that they hadn't really taken a long look and translated a lot of them, but they could. Yeah. But, may, but somebody recently, I thought, I heard or read that they had more of them that had been translated that were able to be translated. Yeah. So we found out a lot more about how they felt about David and why they would have said from what was found in the scrolls. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, so we're going to look at some examples from those documents that describe David in very explicit prophetic language. Um, they talk about, you know, his role as Israel's king and all of that as well, but they're also very concerned with David being a prophet and taking the Psalms as prophecy seriously. At the time these Psalms were written, did the people accept them or was there criticism of them or what was it? How do you mean? Well, a lot of these were critical of the uh, culture at the time. And like Amos, mm -hmm. uh, some of those, they're, they're, not in, they're not taking that as a, you know, a, a, something in the future. They're taking it as, as something that's criticizing them now. In other words, I'm sure. going to destroy you. And, and, uh, so it's, yeah. it's kind of hard to see, you know, read in, uh, you can read, uh, read in Jesus coming from these songs based on what they're saying at that time. Yeah, and one of the things that we're going to look at uh, in the next couple of weeks is some of the, the limitations of our historical knowledge about the Psalms. Uh, there are some Psalms where it's very obvious that, you know, Psalm 2, for example, which talks about the crowning of Israel's king, probably used in coronation ceremonies and had a, a pretty set liturgical purpose. With a lot of the Psalms, we just don't have access to that sort of information. So it can be hard to tell exactly how the Psalms would have been regarded uh, by their original audience. Does this shed a new light on how God said David's a man after my own heart is because he selects? I thought in an Old Testament class that we've been in, the mm. professor brought up that it was he selected him. It was not that David had any really... Um, things about the positive things about his personality that God God selected him because that's who he wanted and that's who he knew that he was going to deal with through history that that was his yeah plan. yeah and I mean you know even in our our sermon series about Abraham you know we get the sense that these figures who are very important to the story of Israel even prophetic you know Abraham's described as a prophet uh, in places uh, they are flawed uh, the interesting thing about some of what we'll talk about in terms of David being a prophet is that a lot of those foibles and flaws that we're very used to discussing, you know, in the life of David, um, are kind of overlooked. David is the prophet, and so we're not focusing so much on, uh, you know, negative things about him, but he sort of becomes this conduit for, for divine speech. So did David write all of the Psalms? So that's, here's, here's another thing that we're going to look at, uh, and that is, over time, and as we get closer and closer to the time of the apostles, the entire book of Psalms becomes so tightly associated with David. Not that he wrote all of them, but the Psalms become so closely connected with David the person, and therefore David the prophet, that Really, in the Second Temple period, all of the Psalms are kind of candidates for this prophetic style of reading. Um, it's interesting. We'll talk more about that. Any other questions? Wouldn't David have known somehow from God 
that he was chosen because of the whole history coming up, that the whole deal with Goliath and and you know the miraculous things that God protected him, all the stuff. He knew that, you know, it seems like to me that he would know that he would, God was using him and calling him and, and all that. I mean, from the body of scripture that mm -hmm. from the Old Testament of, of how he became king, known that he was called to be the king and sure. and, and all that. So it, had, it almost seemed like you'd have to know that. God. Yeah, so that's the interesting thing. Um, Especially with Saul, you know, the whole transition. Yeah, so again, this is something that we'll talk today, today is all about whetting your appetite for a bunch of stuff that I'm going to say <laughs> some other time. Yeah. Not to cop out, but you understand. Um, the idea of anointing, uh, you know, we get the word Messiah from the Hebrew word for to anoint, um, is associated in our minds most closely with kingship. Uh, so Samuel anoints David king of Israel, 2 Samuel 7, God's uh, great covenant with David that he will have an everlasting throne, etc., etc. Uh, but the thing that is interesting is that even from the very early days of you know, David being anointed king of Israel, that anointing is not only to do with kingship, but with prophecy. Um, so we might even think of David, and you know, even in Second Temple Judaism, David's uh, through Psalm, casting out of the evil spirit that was plaguing Saul after his anointing as king, that's read as, as kind of a prophetic activity, uh, which is kind of interesting. So we, we're going to see that the idea that David was anointed by God isn't just about kingship, it's about prophethood as well, and that means that David, or Jesus as David's son, he kind of also has that dual prophetic royal anointing. Um, so this idea that David is a prophet, that plays very well with Jesus as a new Moses, a new Elijah, all of this other stuff that's developed in the Gospels. I mean, I just thought of something while you were saying that. I mean, I know that in a sense, I mean, you, you talked about his, you know, kind of soothing or soothing of Saul's, or yep. Saul's afflictions as a prophet, but isn't, isn't that more of a, a, a priestly function, kind of almost showing his priestliness? Yeah, so here's, and I think I'll probably talk about this at some point. I'm not sure where I will fit this in, but <laughs> the threefold office of Christ, prophet, priest, and king, yeah. is a super convenient way uh, to kind of compartmentalize different aspects of Jesus' ministry. But sometimes we forget that he does all three at the same time, all the time. Uh -huh. Even David, you know, Jesus will imitate or cite David as justification for his disciples picking grain on the Sabbath. He'll use as justification that instance where David goes into the tabernacle to take the showbread, something that only a priest would do. Um, so you have David also behaving in some priestly ways as well. So in David, just like in Jesus, you do have this prophet, priest, king thing going on. Um, so I'd hesitate to try to parse out those things too strictly. But I'm glad you're thinking in those, in those terms. Because that's, that's the sort of thing we want to be paying attention to. Okay, that's my time. Uh, so next time, we're going to start looking at... The ways that we read the Psalter, what are some of the things that we look for as modern 21st century readers, um, how do those things affect our reading and our understanding of the text, how have other people interpreted the Psalms in history, so I'll see you all next time.